And uh, we are going to move up item 6B3, uh, Public Safety Committee meeting uh, to the terms of reference. And this is going to be introduced by Ms. Curry. Thank you, Chair. You might wonder why I'm introducing public safety terms of reference, but it's simply because it's the terms of reference. Um, I won't be the staff liaison in charge of this committee by any means, but as the terms of reference and meeting mandate falls under my portfolio, I'm introducing this. This, um, uh, the item today is for you to consider and potentially approve the terms of reference created for a public safety committee. Um, First off, the reason it is a committee and not necessarily um, named a task force or a working group, there was consideration into that. Um, and the reason it stayed as a committee and we're recommending it be a committee is that a task force has a, a certain purpose. It, um, it has a, um, a mandate to um, do one thing or take care of one thing or complete a task and then the term ends. Um, we figured public safety, as has been, you know, apparent for the last several years, is an ongoing matter that doesn't seem to have an end date. So we have, um, in the terms of reference, suggested it be for the term of your council. So this comes to you um, at the May 1st, 2023 council meeting. Council directed staff to develop a terms of reference for a public safety committee, and it is here before you today. The proposed mandate, and we did consult with um, Tim Doyle, our fire chief, Lisa Fletcher, um, officer in charge for the RCMP, and unfortunately she wasn't able to be here today, and Dave LaBerge, director of public safety. So he and Mr. Um, chief Doyle are here to answer any questions that you may have in details. But the proposed mandate is to provide a forum for engaged citizens to discuss concerns and propose solutions that would serve to enhance safety and security. To advise council on strategic and policy initiatives related to the city's provision of public safety programs with a goal of maintaining and enhancing a safe and healthy community. So as with any council committee, they would make recommendations to council for council's consideration. The proposed membership is nine voting members of which there are two members of council as with our other committees and seven members of the public. The membership el eligibility will reflect a broad cross selection of city of Nanaimo residents be appointed on the basis of their availability, experience, and expertise, and have no conflict of interest with council or the committee. And this is set out in our council procedure bylaw as well as our committee operating guidelines. So city plan, as you all know, clearly identifies a healthy Nanaimo as one of our its five goals, and a healthy Nanaimo community well-being well -being and livability, including community safety, affordable housing, and emergency preparedness is part of that mandate. So social, health, and public safety challenges are one of the six focus areas of Council's 2020 three to 2026 strategic framework. So as well as it being in the city plan, it is in council strategic framework, outlining the overall direction that council has set for the city and city staff, that safety and public safety is the forefront of importance um, for all of you. So this committee would um, be one of those um, platforms in which you are um, doing your work there. So the recommendation that is before you is that the Governance and Priorities Committee recommend council endorse the terms of reference for a public safety committee and direct staff to commence with advertising for membership. If the committee recommends this and council then approves it, we would then set out to get those seven members of the public um, to um, be brought forward to you for your consideration and at that time appoint two members of council to the committee as well. Something else to mention in the mandate that is outlined in the actual terms of reference in your agenda package is um, the consideration of the different um, items under, under um, consideration. And one that was brought forward by both Superintendent and Chief Doyle was the drug toxicity. Um, and 
though not specifically named, it would of course be something that would be in the advocacy portion of the terms of reference, that the committee would continue and assist council and the city of Nanaimo with advocating for um, to higher levels of, the, of government, the province, the federal government, when it came to um, matters such as drug to toxicity. So I just wanted to mention that as well. So that is the end of my very short presentation. If there is any questions, I'm here to answer anything around the terms of reference. And as I mentioned, um, Mr. LaBerge and Chief Doyle are here as well. Thank you, Ms. McGurry. Uh, Councilor Armstrong, you had a question. No, no, please address the board. Okay, uh, moved by Councilor Armstrong, seconded by Councilor Perino, and Okay, any, any further discussion? Uh, Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. I um, <clears throat> just wanna, uh, Ms. Gurry, you said that part of the mandate will include advocacy regarding drug toxicity. I don't see that in the terms of reference. Is that just uh, something that we think we will add on? <clears throat> um, thank you, Councillor Hammond. So in the purpose section and the third bullet after the, the residential and commercial business safety, public nuisance matters, graffiti vandalism, vehicular crime, traffic safety, enhancing public safety and security and fire safety is also um, to support advocacy work relating to public safety, including integrated enforcement, social responses, and the protection of vulnerable persons. And I saw it as included in, in that bullet. I'm not sure if you wanted it more distinctly noted and you could have that but that is where I envisioned it when that's fine by me I just think if our <clears throat> superintendent of police and our fire chief say that we should have it in we should probably have it specifically but I'm happy to vote for it as is as long as that is understood um, one piece I would I would think that the safety committee traffic safety is probably a little bit outside of scope but I'm not gonna stall the terms of reference for it any further discussion Seeing none, all those in favor? And any opposed? See none opposed. Oh, Tyler, are you opposed? Okay. Councillor Brown is opposed. So it wasn't totally formal there. Uh, so now, yes, Councillor Perino. Um, Chair, if, if I could recommend a deferral of uh, the second uh, under the Prosperous Nanaimo, the review of city incentives and tax exemption. If I could defer that to the next uh, meeting. So we have a motion. Is there a seconder? Councillor Armstrong. And may I speak to the deferral? Yes. Simply two of our, our, our of course, uh, uh, Mayor Krogh is away and with one of our councillors away. It's a big, big topic and I'd like to have uh, adequate time to discuss it with the staff that are needed to be here and it's getting late in the day. Any other discussion? I was ready to rumble, but. <laughs> you ready to rumble. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none opposed. Okay. Um, is there any further business? Uh, well, well, Chair, there is the, the option to go back to the one item that we had postponed just to finish it up. Which was the which was the first item on our agenda? And so there's is there a discussion on this issue going back to a healthy Nanaimo the um, warming, warming center, center recommendations? Any discussion? Yes. No. Sorry. Sorry, I apologize. I, I think we were thinking, Chair, that it would go back to staff for final comments. Uh, yeah. Sorry. It's yeah, we we did bounce this to the end of the meeting. And so yeah, I'm I, sorry, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I, I know and maybe I'll invite some of the staff back who are up here earlier in case there's other questions from council. Um, I, I think you had a few of them when we kind of maybe cut that conversation short. Just some, some thoughts and observations I had as we were having that discussion this afternoon. And I think the real question on council is where do we go from here and is there further direction that's required? So maybe if you don't mind, if I could just take a couple of minutes uh, to go over some points I wanted to make. And um, I think first of all, the need 
or the recognition that we're short shelter beds in this community has been known by this council for a long time and there's been advocacy work by you uh, this last council and this council to advocate to the province to provide more permanent um, shelter beds and most most recently that was brought up at UBCM with all of our meetings with the minister that that's at the shortage in the community uh, we clearly know that there's not enough uh, shelter beds in here in the, sorry in the community right now um, I would say that staff are focusing much of their efforts right now and, and I'm um, sorry I think it was council Councillor Eastmere that said our focus on providing permanent housing I'd say a significant amount of staff efforts right now on providing more permanent housing and even transitional housing and a lot of our efforts are are there today uh, the other comment that came up about the 2017 um, EWR uh, program and how that was discontinued I, I think it's more appropriate to say that that evolved so for what, what council may not know is in 2017 the province did through BC housing fund an EWR program the EWR program is much like the EMBC program it's it's difficult in that it's based on triggers and, and weather so the EWR program is, is great because additional services are, are good, but the problem is to have a program that runs for two nights and then it's not running for three nights and then it's back open for one night. It, it's very difficult, obviously, for people who are accessing those services, but also just to get staffing to run those facilities. So back in 2017, when we had a facility that was running under the EWR, Council of the Day actually put in extra money. So the city funded the non-EWR nights. So what happened is what was an EWR facility was able to become a full seasonal shelter and then that eventually evolved and BC Housing took that over and paid for it as a shelter space. So it wasn't as much that we could discontinued EWR as that it kind of evolved into more permanent shelter space. Not to say that we shouldn't go after further EWR money. I was here happy to hear today from the SPO that they're taking those steps that they've made an application in terms of I don't think there's any direction required from council but we'll continue to assist them in their application uh, and and wish them luck in getting that facility up and running the other thing I wanted to mention is the the um, I, I, I still want to call it the EMBC but the EMCR money now because they've changed names on us the EMCR uh, money and last year was the first year at least in my recollection that the city's ever accessed money uh, to provide space and we, we, um, we did that for overnight space, as was mentioned. We were getting pressure um, uh, pressure to, to participate in that area. Uh, so that, that continues to be, I would say, staff's focus, is making sure when we hit those cold weather thresholds from Environment Canada that we have spaces that are able to trigger and operate under that EMCR money. And that, it again, has very problematic, and then it might only be for two nights or three nights in the entire winter. Maybe it'll be three nights and it'll be a period trying to get staff at noon uh, when the weather you know ter determination is made for that night to, to be there and work all evening is very difficult whether it was us or a nonprofit or anybody in the community so it's a difficult program to operate under beyond um, trying to find a space for us to operate in and, and I think that's the other thing I wanted to mention on here is if you recall we did have that grant program in 2022 um, which allowed us to go out early. So all through last spring, all through last summer, Miss Wood was out pounding the pavement, uh, figuratively and literally, looking for anybody who would open facilities with this grant money. And uh, we did not have a lot of success. And I would, I would want to um, note that both Risebridge and, and, and St. Paul's, with the help of 710, did step forward and recognize them for that. They did work that allowed us to have those daytime warming centers open. But I would, I would suggest to you that our focus now in terms of, unless we were directed otherwise by council, it's not, we don't feel the same pressure for daytime warming spaces as we do for the nighttime spaces. Having a daytime space is great, but if at five o'clock or seven o'clock people are pushed back out into the street, it's not necessarily the areas of focus where, where as staff, we, we personally think that there's the greatest, um, greatest amount of need. So, in absence of any direction from council, we'll continue to work on on what we can do for, we're set up for the EMCR uh, funding and that we have both operators and facilities that are willing to do that. And again, it's a challenge because it's last minute, uh, but if we can access those fundings, we will do that. No further direction from council required. Uh, if the SPO is taking on a further application to EWR, staff will support them in that application and, and uh, hope, that they're, hope that they're successful. Um, and then the final is, uh, you know, staff are continuing to work with BC Housing around permanent housing. 
and I think your 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 um, work that you're doing in terms of advocating for additional shelter beds, we are way undersupplied for um, communities that have comparable numbers. Uh, if you look at population per, per homeless or per homeless population, and then I'm a is way under, in our opinion, funded. Your Health and Housing Task Force told you that. We've been advocating for a long time for more shelter space. Again, the challenge is often, there's definitely a funding problem, but there's also a challenge in finding willing um, facilities, willing buildings that are able to take these uses on and a capacity in our system to have staffing in those in those facilities. So definitely challenges. So I just wanted to, I think the question was, is further direction required from council? I don't think at this point, there, Mr. Chairman, I think there's there's probably a larger discussion in kind of the downloading of the provincial government into local governments around this, and um, there's no debate of the need. And at, the, and at some point, it seems somewhat um, silly to have a discussion about well, it's not ours; it's someone else's. The truth is that there's need in the community. If council wanted to take a further step, the step would be: Are we going to step into that lane more than we do now? Which means take on a role outside of ours. I think that's the big. Uh, discussion for council in the long term. I'm not suggesting you have that today, um, but if in the void that's there, in the in this in the amount of numbers we know we're short, is that something that we want to take on? And that, I guess that's ultimately the question for council to have. But okay. unless there's any questions for staff or staff have anything further to add from what I have, I have Councillor Perino, Councillor Armstrong, and then Councillor Gesselbrock on my list. Councillor Perino, thank you, Chair. I, I think you said we probably don't need to give you further direction because I think we were all sitting here thinking, well, now what? You know, how do we move this forward? And I was so glad you said it. For me, it was like, well, what happens after 7 o'clock at night? It's always the night that's colder than during the day. And then you have, you know, so, so where's the balance of this? So what's the best thing that you don't need direction from us now? You're going to continue on. Is that what you're saying? You're going to continue on to... I just want to clarify that we're, that we're moving in the right direction because I do remember last year when you were out there literally pounding the pavement. And thank goodness, I mean, Rise Bridge starting up the way they did and it was the, was it the 710 that did, I mean, yeah, we can't do this. We can't do this to that, to those groups either. Sure. The, uh, the unfortunate reality is we're heading into a winter yeah. season where we know we're not going to have enough beds. And I think it was, it was, um, I can't remember, I think it was Councillor Hemmons that asked the question about what difference would have made last year had we had funding in place for, for EWR, and, yeah. and my answer would be none. Like We would have had 30, maybe 30 more people in EDR, EWR build beds, but we'd still have 400 plus out in the community yeah. that wouldn't have had anything. So we still would have been in a place of having to access EMCR. That's not gonna change anytime soon. Uh, it puts pressure on yeah. staff to, in those points to kind of ramp up and try to make connections to get people but we're doing work ahead of time right now to try to connect with uh, organizations in the community making sure that we identify who has capacity to take it on if, if we get to those triggers hopefully we don't see many this winter um, but if we do get there trying to be make sure we're in a space that we can at least provide um, flow through for that funding so that those okay. services can so operate. you don't need anything in particular from us today okay no thank you chair Councillor Armstrong. Um, for me, I do have further direction I would like to see. Having listened to the uh, presentations, whatever, and then watching in the crowd, I saw many service providers here that were shaking their head at some of the stuff. So I would like to hear from the service providers directly, perhaps sitting in camera, um, as to the issues that they're seeing, what they're facing, and what they found inaccurate in the report, if there was inaccuracies. But that's what I was told by two that I spoke with. So I, I, I would like to, to hear from them direct. Um, I'm concerned if there is inaccuracies that the report came forward that way. Um, so for me, I think it's really important that we hear it. And then as a further step at a later date, I would like to see the MLAs, the MP, sit down with council and all the service providers at a round table to discuss exactly what's going on in our community, what the issues are, and then come forward as a united front as the MLAs, the MPs, service providers to put forward a plan to the provincial government and the federal government. Thank you. Is that a motion? Well, okay, <laughs> Councillor Gesselbrock. Uh, thanks. Um, just following up on on Councillor Armstrong's uh, comment. Um, so when we met with the minister, uh, or maybe it was BC Housing, or maybe it was Island Health. I, I can't recall, but we did have a request around the emergency. Um, 
warming uh, facilities and there was some tension and confusion or discussion around who's going to pay for what and the process going forward and I'm curious like was that are we pursuing that and is that sorted out like is that an issue for us going forward I, I can't recall exactly what it was over but yeah uh, through the through the chair I, I would say that um, uh, the medical health officers are generally interested in where communities are going on this so we have an upcoming call scheduled um, uh, with the island MHO who was in our meeting that day uh, to kind of talk about this but what we would be doing is saying that staff are working to identify locations and operators that will be able to respond to the EM uh, see our funding when we when we put out a call for requests so that we have people in there so that's what we'll be uh, communicating I, I suspect that the position might be well that that won't be enough and we agree that you know there won't be a place for 400 people this winter absolutely agree mm -hmm. um, but um, I do not agree with the chat with the suggestion that it's the city's responsibility to do that mm -hmm. it is um, you know clearly and historically always been recognition that it's a provincial responsibility for housing and the BC housing specifically is, has a responsibility for shelter spaces and for for overnight spaces. Mm -hmm. So, just, and, just sorry, can I just and Miss Gary just whispered in my ear, reminding me, you actually had a, a motion, um, a resolution, sorry, that went to UBCM that was passed at the UBCM table on on this very point to make sure that the province uh, is funding and it's not falling to cities to take up the role of of providing emergency mm -hmm. housing. And just following up on that, w would it be worthwhile coming into this season? Like, I, like one, I feel kind of confused around all this, and I don't have a sense that like we're we'll go into the season and it's going to be a kerfuffle again, like it was last year. Uh, I, I don't feel a hundred percent secure that 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 it's not going to be like that again, um, and I think that's what we're kind of hoping for, and and. You know, if it is a resource shortage issue, is it worthwhile putting out a press release saying that we're coming into the winter season? Uh, you know, we're going to require X amount of shelter beds. The city doesn't have the resources or the money to get this going, uh, and you know, it is a provincial responsibility. What what exactly is going to happen? And and maybe I'm just me reading this. I like I'd be curious to hear from staff. Like, are we going into this season? Like, or are we going to get? You know the phone calls and the pressure again to deal deal with this issue that um, that is is inevitably going to come. Um, through the chair, I'd like to tell you that you're not, but I, I think there's a good chance that yes, just simply the reality of how many people we have living mm -hmm. on the street right now or living on house right now, uh, that if there is a very severe weather event, I think yes, there'll be more expectation that somebody does does more. So I think you know part of what we can do. I don't think there needs to be a motion on this, but part of what we can do is make sure that our that our plans for the extreme weather are well communicated out. Uh, if there wants, if there's further advocacy that comes out of that from council, that I think that could, that would also be appropriate. I think, but that should probably be a council uh, council resolution. Okay, and 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 just the question, like just listening to the C SBO and. Um, you know the pivotal role that the city of Nanaimo and our staff play in citing and, and doing a lot of the organizing around this um, in terms of the amount of staff that we have working on this is this something that is like do we have the adequate numbers for the organizing that we're kind of being requested to 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 do like is or, or do we have are we resource enough to be dealing with what's being requested on us not 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 even just the service provision or um, that, but just responding to the requests from other agencies and BC Housing and the coordination that we're n we're being put in. Regardless, um, are we are we stressing ourselves in the sense of like the amount of people on, on this? And that's a yeah. I'm just curious about I, I, that. I would say um, through the chair again. I, I would say we're putting a lot of work on our staff. Um, uh, to do a significant amount of work in this area. I think I've been in this chair now for four weeks and I hope to come forward to council in the next uh, couple of weeks to talk about areas in, in the city where I think we could use some additional support. This is definitely something that's on my radar and I hope to come forward to council with some of my, my plans around that in the near future. So um, yes, I would say generally agree with you. This is an area where uh, 
you know, for example, a significant amount of staff time is taken right now. Ms. Wood's time is taken on the, on the um, I'm going to get the name wrong, the, the table. It's, it's changed the name. It was the situation acute. table, but... The Nanaimo acute response table. Yeah, so, I, so for example, for those who don't know, that's the table where, you know, individuals are identified and largely, I would say, Ms. Wood's role is to coordinate provincial agencies and responding to the need. And we're, we're now, you know, good, it seems like good, good work's being done there, but it is taking more time and more resources. So yes, I, I recognize that we could definitely deal with more and I look forward to having that conversation with council. Sorry, and you mentioned um, the word citing and it triggered me on something else I wanted to say that was shared earlier here today in the report from the SPO, not from the city, from the SPO it identified potential locations throughout the city where future shelters could happen. And, I, and one of you, I'm sorry, I can't remember who had a question about where did this list come from and have you engaged with those property owners? And I think there was a suggestion that, well, the city gave us the list. If you look at the report, it actually says the list was based on a discussion with our community safety officers. So I'm sure our safety officers, um, you know, did, if they're asked the question about where could they go, they, they've done what I think most people do and they've identified vacant buildings that they're aware of in the city. I would say that's very different than the city has identified or encouraged sites. I think uh, anything beyond our, our frontline staff identifying places that are currently vacant. So I didn't want to give the impression either to property owners um, or anyone in the community that, you know, there's already been determinations to move forward because I'm sure the property owners that were mentioned today have no awareness of this because there's certainly been no outreach or engagement from the city, city on those. So well, thank, you for, and thank you for that. And it's called spitballing, I think. And just, just the, the last comment and like some of this stuff is going to require following up sort of in another capacity other than sort of at, at at this particular committee, but I think, you know, with the SBO that was created, um, and now we're sort of transitioning, there's like some responsibility and coordination happening. We, we had motions requesting that the SBO come and facilitate the discussions, and I think like, one, I don't really mean to say it, it's early on, because really it's not early on. Like, we've, we, we try to set this up for a long, long time, but I think just having a candid conversation on how the communication is going and are we setting things up in a way that is like effectively addressing these issues or are is the way that it's set up in the communication allowing for not clear expectations and responsibilities um, for what we're trying to achieve and um, I think that's a conversation that we do need to uh, engage in um, to ensure you know we're allocating resources in a way that's going to meet our objectives effectively. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I do have some questions because I did see um, a staff email about potential warming centers, the library, rec centers, I can't remember what, what all was on that list, but is there, do we have a list of city facilities that can be used for warming centers that are appropriate? Mr. Chairman, I'll let the uh, I'll let staff respond, but I want to be really clear. We're talking about daytime, daytime warming, warming spaces. Yes. We're talking about city facilities, so maybe I'll yeah. ask and respond. Uh, through the chair, to the chair. Um, so I think you also, council, received an email about a preseason meeting that was held with service providers on October 5th. Uh, so we had a number of service providers attend, and knowing that we have limited access to funds, we really tried to also explore what current resources and existing capacity folks had. So we did have um, community agencies such as Vancouver Island Regional Library come forward saying that they would like to be identified as a warming space where people can go um, to, to get warmed up, as well as CMHA who has their social drop-in. But of course, these are only during regular programming hours. So I think that's kind of where the limitation is. Um, but so we do have a listing of that that we keep with and we do communicate that out to the community um, It's currently also just already on our website as supports and services for folks um, And then we do do a call out like a you know a, a notification when we do get colder weather about these regularly program um, Services that people can can access Okay, thank you um, just to counselor Perino's point about um, warming centers clearing out at 7 St. Peter's, um, have, have, they've had an emergency weather shelter for a number of years and they use the facility for other things during the day. So I've never seen them keep it during the day. Have they ever kept it as emergency warming during the day, St. Peter's? 
Uh, through looking at past history, and I know talking with um, the executive director of Nanaimo Family Life Association, that that wouldn't be something that would be available for during the day. It's just for a night. Yeah. No, just for a night. Yeah, they use it for other things during during the day. And, and with the U Unitarian, because it's uh, across the street from a school, part of the agreement is that people get cleared out of the neighborhood. And so they have to have somewhere to go for warming during the day. And I think that that's the case with, with the, uh, the shelter beds. So any other comments? Or yeah, sorry. Councillor Gesselbrock. Uh, just, just the last thing to follow up on. So we have a shortage of shelter beds and that's kind of what ultimately is needed for when people, when it gets cold, so people can go somewhere at night. Um, then there's these like temperature triggered funding streams, the one and then the, the, the one that they're doing the application for the E, I can't remember the, the thing, e, e, EWR or whatever. Um, in that, there was a position, a coordinator position. And I think right now it's being uh, submitted as uh, CMHC, potentially, if we get that money. But it sounds like they're, it's a placeholder. They don't really want to, to have that role. And so there's this thing. And I think ultimately, these roles keep coming back to the city regardless. And it's like, is that an area that we need, do need look at, looking at? Is like, is that a role that we're going to take on? Like, when, when the problems happen, it does seem to come back to the city, not to um, fund everything, but we're on the ground with the relationships and coordinating. And I think like we're still on the fence of with even the warm centers, like, okay, do we let the nonprofits deal with it all through BC housing or do we just keep on taking a larger role? And it's like, okay, that is our role. We coordinate the, 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 the warming response in the city not saying that we're the funder of it and that, but we just make sure it gets done and that the information gets out to the right people and that is actually our rightful role. It's not a downloading. This is like nobody else is effectively can execute on that because they're not the central node of the, the network. Um, and is this a decision point, like a, a policy decision that we need to like adjust on like how much of a role in the whole warming center response does the city take on? Like, is it, are we the central node in the system in relationship with BC housing, or is it sort of this like nebulous distributed thing between nonprofits, us, and that? And it's just like, I think that's one of the central struggles that we're having and is that like there's no, there's no central coordinating force still. And I, and I think the SBO, that was consideration, but it might not be the, the right location. And so I'm just putting that out there. Uh, and um, I don't know if there's any comment on it yet, or is that something that we need to sort of like build up for a conversation on? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A lot, a lot there to unpack. Yeah. But a couple of things I, I guess I would say is, <laughs> um, and it goes back to my earlier point, I think, you know, I think we. We know where the lanes are and who's responsible for what. The bigger, I think, what you're saying is the bigger question is: Do we need, do we need to step more into a lane that hasn't traditionally been ours? And mm -hmm. and you know, that's the whole evolving nature of local government discussion. And but with that, of course, comes you know, a greater pressure on our on our tax paying citizens to cover what are traditionally provincial services. The other part, in terms of the EWR, and I and and we have experts here who can speak to this better than I can. Um, but I would say in our understanding is across the province, the EWR programs are generally run by nonprofit groups with the direct contract to BC Housing. And I think maybe Ms. Wood in a past life actually has some experience with that. So maybe I'll ask her to comment on it. Yeah, through the chair. Uh, I So the EWR is um, the coordinator position that you're kind of touching upon. Uh, typically um, is kind of whoever's operating that um, emergency weather shelter during that time usually calls calls the extreme weather um, and is the coordinator of that. So I think probably in the SPO application, they put CMHA as a placeholder there. Um, and it, it would it's a natural fit for that agency to be the coordinator of that role um, and to call that threshold. So Okay, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that clarity. And I and I think um, uh, Could I just add a comment? And, um, without absolutely, without advocating any um, 
recommendation from staff, but there is a model that exists for the city to take on a more hands-on role in um, managing our, uh, sort of what the council, council, council Breck, what you're alluding to is, um, and it goes to what the MHO was, was felt like they weren't seeing last December, I think, in that um, there, the city of Victoria, for instance, goes outside of their lane and uh, organizes and coordinates um, staff to stand up um, extreme weather shelter spaces. The city of Victoria. So there is a, is there's a model that exists. Is yeah. Yeah, th you know, th thanks for that. And I, and I think it is a larger debate, but I think there's just like, um, it's a persistent issue. Um, and it's a larger issue. And traditionally in the past, I think it was like, you know, smaller agencies, you know, you could coordinate and uh, organize in that manner. And I don't think that that way of doing in the past is commensurate to with the scale now that's being required of, our, of the community. And I think that there's still this like resistance to fully recognizing the scale that we have to be organizing and the degree of integration that is required. And I, and I do think it's a larger discussion that is gonna you know, take some while to, to like weed through, but I, I do think we do need to flag it and, and not be shy to, to address it. Okay. Councillor Eastmere. Thank you through, through the chair to staff. I, I think I would like to pick up on the point that Councillor Gesselbrock raised about potentially taking on a more uh, direct advocacy role or putting putting out a press release or something to that to that effect. Um, because I don't think anyone is gonna tell our story the way that, that we can tell the story and has the direct uh, lines of communication to our MLA and M MP on this. Uh, and we're definitely in a worse position than we were last year because we don't have any funding uh, identified. So um, I think we need to ring the, the alarm on this as soon as possible. Uh, and I think a press release is the best way to do that because letters directly uh, sometimes get lost in the, in the inbox um, based on the amount of information coming in. And it is gonna take some public pressure on this, unfortunately, for us to, to get some action on it um, and it's always going to fall to the, the city not doing enough um, and I'm willing to, to take the heat for that but I, I really want us to be able to push it back and, and say that we, we need the funding to be able to do this. We have the operators and capacity to do it but the dollars can't come out of our budget every single year. It's just not sustainable. So how, how would we be able to move forward with a, a press release on this? Does that require a motion? Um, thank you, Chair, through you to Councillor Eastmere. I think a, a statement rather than a, a news release would be the way to go, and the statement would say, um, it would state the city's need and council's desire to um, not only get funding and advocate for funding, but let the service providers know of the need and get the story out there like you were saying. So I think a motion for a statement um, that staff could help prepare. Um, getting that out there, specifying those needs and, and that desire. Great, and I think um, if it could include the piece about the UBCM resolution, because I that that is great, I'm glad that passed at UBCM, but we've often talked about how resolutions go to UBCM, they get passed and they go in a binder and you know, not a whole lot happens, but uh, that one, we were all really aligned on it and we, have, we know we have the backing of other communities across the province, so um, I think that will resonate as well when we, when we put that out. So are you making a motion to have a statement? Yes. Um, seconded by Councillor Hammonds. Any discussion? Councillor Hammonds. Thank you. Um, great idea, happy to support. And I think um, when we get down to the writing of it, part of our story is that compared to other communities, we have a significant number of people who are spending the night outside. So comparatively, I think the stats it's written in another notebook, but I believe we have 76% of our unhoused population who don't have a place to sleep at night, whereas Vancouver, with a population of about 5,000 unhoused, have just over 30% spending the night outside. So that, that is a significant um, injustice in how they're uh, distributing the funding, and we should emphasize that. Thanks. Any other comments? Oh, sorry. Councillor Perino. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll, I'll vote in favor of this. I'm not against it at all. The only thing that I'm thinking of is, uh, 
I particularly liked what Councillor Armstrong said about getting together with our community providers and having um, a workshop type with both our MLA and our MP to uh, discuss the problems and the lack of funding and then make a statement. I, I would have preferred that only because I think our community providers can give us a, an education that we did not receive today, that we're not aware of uh, some of the problems that they're going through and the funding uh, shortfalls that we might not necessarily be aware of. That's the only thing that I'm thinking of. I really appreciated what Councillor Armstrong said with that statement and uh, I'm not sure that we shouldn't wait, but uh, I'll, I'll vote in favor of this just to, it, 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 that doesn't appeal to everybody. I'm still prepared to vote in favor of it. Any other comments or? Oh, Council Tyler, Councillor Brown. Go ahead, I think you're muted still. Sorry, yeah, no, I had trouble finding my button when all of a sudden my screen was filled with my own face and still is. Um, uh, disorienting. Um, I'm, I'm happy to support this motion. Um, I do think Councillor Hammonds raises a really good point, and I, but I also think we need to sort of tread carefully with this, um, with this motion. And, uh, you know, we have been working, I think, to develop better relationships both politically and at a staff level with, uh, provincial counterparts. And, um, and there's a there's a fine line there, and I think something to tread carefully around is ensuring that we're not just passing blame um, and and undermining those other conversations that we are having. And and I just highlight that as an area of concern of, of how we might craft it. Um, and you know, I, I think there can be a temptation to want to meet with people to discuss and MLAs and MPs at times about where we might be missed, you know, what the problem is and how we might solve it. Um, I, I, I just don't know how productive that is because I think a lot of these conversations have really been happened and quantified to a degree. And, you know, I, I think like the Health and Housing Task Force, um, you know, they produced a document and a lot of that information is there. It's already out of date. We know that, but, um, you know, again, I really think it's got to be that shift to action and just like, finding pragmatic solutions to some of these problems and, and completing things that are underway. So, um, yeah, I support of the motion. Um, um, and I think there is a conversation around for council and with staff about how, how we build on the past successes, identify the challenges and find collective ways to, um, develop those partnerships to overcome them. Um, and then maybe at that point it's about developing those to have some conversations about removing those roadblocks. Thanks. Thank you. Any further discussion? Call, call the question. Or, oh, Councillor Ismir, go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, just in, in response to Councillor Brown's point about us needing to kind of tread carefully on this subject, I, like I definitely see see where that's coming from and. For me, like this is not, it's not a personal thing. It's never personal. This is like a systemic issue that we're, that we're dealing with. So uh, while I, I trust that we're like working on building good relationships with our, with our community partners and with our other people in positions of, of power, like this is a time when we do unfortunately have to get loud about it because it's getting cold um, and we're not, Seeing, uh, seeing them come to the table with the kind of resources that are going to enable our community to thrive at this point. So um, yeah, it's just, I would just reiterate, it's really, it's not a, not a personal thing. And, but, but we all take it really personally because it's our community that we really care about and people are suffering. Um, so I would hope that in, in putting this out, it's, it's, not, it's not a personal criticism, it's just, it's, it's a systemic issue and I'm hoping that we can work together to find some longer term sustainable solutions. Thank you. Okay, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor? And any opposed? Seeing none opposed, the motion passes. Mr. Chair, yes. 
Yes. I just wanted to point out just uh, like the process wise that these recommendations made here today go to the next council meeting um, under consent. So it wouldn't be until after that that the statement was prepared and sent out. Just wanted to remind you of that. Okay. So our next uh, agenda item is question period. Are there any questions for council for the committee? No. Okay. Any questions from the from the audience? Um, I have a question. Yeah, come come down to the mic, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for hearing me for a second. I guess my question is really just to city management around EMCR. Oh, could you tell us your name and oh, and, and absolutely. My name is Siobhan Johnson. I'm a director with Risebridge. Uh, so in just conversation around EMCR at the present moment, because that's going to be the only thing that's available to us over the next few weeks, we know snow is coming. We need services right now. Many other municipalities have started a warming center already, and we had made mention many times over the last seven months that we would be available to operate as of November 1st. As we know, there's no funding to do so. Uh, however, we're still preparing uh, for staffing to ensure that something could be offered in community. Right now, from an operational standpoint, EMCR is our only availability. And as you hear, that's being taken on by city management beside me. Um, they have sent out many emails to us requesting for an EMCR budget. Our challenge is that I can't just operate under EMCR. If we're not already operating a service, I don't have staff, myself included. We don't have a lease. We don't have a building. We don't have insurance. Um, we can't just operate. Last year, EMCR was 12 days. EWR was 50 days. We did have EWR beds uh, going through EC, ICCS, uh, through MFLA. That just added an additional five beds to their shelters already. When we were operating last year, we got EMCR on top of the warming center for the first five days of snowfall. EMCR through Miss Wood allowed us to continue to operate for 24 hours. We held 103 people the first night in overnight. Um, and as far as letting people out, most of the people that we are serving actually do stay with us because there's no other efficient resource and community for places for people to go. It is super challenging when we have to close in the evening times and let people out. We all are aware that there's not enough shelter spaces. So I'm concerned about the plan of going through EWR because that might eliminate our chances of having EMCR overnight when we're really gonna need it. And there's some agencies and services like ours that can at least hold in a greater population, which is what our desperate need for community is right now. So my direct question is, if right now our only option is EMCR, what is the EMCR plan? Because I know we will not be able to take that on, and we knew the city efforts, I'm sorry, but in the past have not been successful. So which organizations and how many, po what population is gonna be able to be served through EMCR? Is there a staff member that wants to respond to that? Um, yeah, sure, I'll do my, do my best. Um, yeah, I think it's a good question. Um, so the way the, the system works is, what I've been characterizing it in our discussions is sort of our, our, our phase, our normal phase one would be daytime warming, phase two would be EWR funding, which has been a gap because that program has evolved as um, Mr. Lindsay mentioned. And then phase three, when we're in extreme response is when we reach out to the Ministry of Emergency Management and ask for a task number and get that funding. Um, my understanding is that EMCR will fund overnight spaces if all other options have been exhausted. So that's my understanding of that. So if we're looking at an overnight situation right now, we can't go to that. But again, it's based on those ex most extreme weather thresholds. So likely not till January, February. Just wanted to be clear that there will be nothing. There's no services. There's no operations. There's no resources in this community until maybe those EMCR days, which we won't see until January, February, which means that as outreach workers, we will be relying on the library or bringing individuals to the emergency. And that is how the province got involved last year with the city, because we started cabbing and busing individuals we were serving to the emergency. And outreach workers from many different agencies decided to protest. And we stayed in our Energy H emergency and wouldn't allow the vulnerable individuals to leave because they were losing limbs. And then we started the frostbite clinic at Risebridge, and which became a bigger conversation as to how we could keep on as a warming center. 
we need places for people to go. And this is gonna come down to city services and NRGH, if not. Okay, thank you. Is there any further comment from staff or? Okay, thank you. Can I say one more thing? I think a, a part, important point that was missed out in the entire conversations today is around the reality of this year, even in comparison till next year. There's many moving pieces, both provincially and federally, which are quite exciting as a service operator to be able to have annual operations happening. I don't think for next year this will be the same conversation. There's many other things coming online and many other funding streams that will see us in a much better position for next year already happening. It essentially is just this year that is the main point of focus. So whatever decisions is being made, I don't think that's setting a precedence. I think it's just gonna be a band-aid for this year so that hopefully next year, SPO and city recommendations can move forward accordingly. Okay, thank you. Councilor Perino. Oh. oh, there's a quick question for you, sorry. Thank you, Chair. I just, just a very quick question. So when you say next year, are you talking like January, February, March of 2024, or are you talking another? Sorry, so the main funding provincially and federally, we're looking at April to May to June announcements. Okay. So there's nothing between now nothing and April between for now and any then. service okay. agency to have. That's, that's an yeah. important piece. Thank it's you. It's just this winter. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That's important. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Did you, did you have? It'd be an inter in, in, interesting context to have for council. I think, uh, you know, from our decision making position, we're, we're looking at, you know, what is the long term that, and if there is programs coming online April, May next year, that definitely changes. Uh, it changes the context to whether, okay, you know, if we're on the hook for something for one year as opposed to, you know, we do it this year, then it's like ongoing download if there is just a stop gap. And so I think, uh, you know, a memo or some information on, you know, what uh, um, is being spoken to uh, would be would be helpful at a, at a later date. And I mean, I, I could follow up after the meeting, but uh, I think that um, that uh, is interesting. Thank you. Councillor Eastmere, did you have a response as well or? No, okay, thank you. Uh, well, that brings us to the end of our agenda. We have a motion to adjourn. Councillor Perino, seconded by Councillor Eastmere. All those in favor? Okay. Have a good rest of your evening. <laughs>